Yes? Okay. Welcome to the OpenL workshop. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. It's uh, Ross King from Manchester University. He's done amazing work. He's uh, published multiple times in Science Magazine. You probably know him from his work on the robot scientists. It's a robot that automatically does experiments, tries to interpret observations, and then ex uh, adjusts the hypothesis, and then runs new experiments. It's a really amazing system. He's also currently working on proving P equals NP. But today, he's going to talk about uh, meta learning on QSR data and how it helps with this research. Thanks. Okay, well, th thank you very much. Is that the mic all working okay? Can you hear it at the back? Okay, good. Uh, so thank you for the invitation to Eindhoven. It's the first time I've ever been here. Uh, um, I'm going to talk about meta learning on QSAR data, and this work goes back over 20 years to this, this project called the Statlog project, uh, which is one of the first uh, uh, comprehensive comparison of machine learning methods. Now, I was thinking about it uh, on the way here, actually. So, one of the uh, conclusions from that study, the empirical study 20 years ago, was that uh, busy networks don't work and that they were by far the worst methods that we tested out 20 years ago. Uh, but of course, that didn't really change. Net busy networks have been a highly successful method. So I'm not completely sure what that means. Whether they, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what it means, but it's interesting, I think, that when we tested them empirically 20 years ago, they didn't work very well at all. Now they work, they work well, and lots of people have spent a lot of time working them. Not because of their uh, empirical success at the time, but because of their elegant approach to statistics and machine learning. Okay, meta learning and QSAR data. Okay, so first the motivation. Uh, it surprises me and sort of disappoints me that uh, many of the, uh, the best people in machine learning spend their life trying to get people to click on certain online adverts, you know, slightly more efficiently than the rival companies. I don't think that's a good use of their talents and life. And for the younger people here, I don't think you should spend your life doing such a thing. It's not, life is short and you should try and do something useful, I think. Uh, of course, it's better than making weapons for the military, which is but advertising, but it's still not particularly uh, uh, something to be proud of, I think. So. Uh, parasitic diseases. The world is still shocking. It's shocking that the world has still got these diseases. They're major diseases. Uh, malaria kills at least a million people a year, perhaps two million. It's, we don't really know because health, uh, especially in India, actually, this is where the, the records are a bit unclear. If someone dies in a remote village, it's not always clear what they died of. It could very well be malaria. Uh, hundreds of millions of people catch malaria every year. Hundreds of millions of people catch cystosomiasis as well. It kills tens of thousands of people. This is horrible parasitic disease of, uh, from a worm. Malaria is caused by a, a single cell parasite, as is Leishmania, which kills tens of thousands of people as well and causes horrible disfiguration. And Chagas disease is from South America, kills tens of thousands of people as well, mostly through complications to heart disease. So these are Major diseases out there, uh, we still need better treatments for them, better drugs. So millions of people die from these diseases, hundreds of millions of people suffer infection. They're so-called neglected tropical diseases because the pharmaceutical industry, in its wisdom, has not spent money on them. Uh, they are, I'm sorry, in our society, they're driven by uh, profit, so they think there's not enough money in these diseases. I think actually their modeling is a bit wrong. So let me try to explain why I think that is. Uh, how I think they work is that they look at different disease classes and look to see how many rich people, or at least people in the Western world, have them. And, uh, and then they think, if I could treat uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, that would be worth so many billion dollars a year to me. And that's how they go about, I think. I think the fundamental flaw there is that they don't take into account the a priori probability of succeeding in finding a drug to treat, say, diabetes type 2, because we don't really understand how that disease works. You know, it's, 
It's something complicated to do with the systemic control of insulin, but we really don't understand it. So it's very hard to treat a disease you don't understand with a single drug. That contrast with these parasitic diseases I talked about earlier, we actually know very well how to treat them. We just they kill the parasite. And it's not a particularly difficult thing to do because they're very different uh, from human cells. You know, the, the last common ancestor was, for most of these, is hundreds of millions of years ago, perhaps billions of years. So we actually know how to treat them. And the pharmaceutical industry could have treated these diseases very easily if they just spent the money, but they haven't. So we need, in the uh, university sector, to be more efficient than the pharmaceutical industry, because they spend, on average, something like a billion dollars to find one drug for one disease. We need to be more efficient. Okay, the problem of uh, finding a drug to treat a disease called drug design, what we want to do is to find a small molecule, a drug, which will modulate the biological activity of a larger chemical called a protein, which will then affect the whole living system. Yeah? And that's how we treat diseases. Normally we find small molecules that uh, specifically bind with proteins. Okay, that's the, that's the name of the game. So small molecules, these are example small molecules. Uh, ibuprofen is the classical pain killer. You know, you take a couple hundred milligrams of that if you have a headache, it works really well. Here is the, so this is one abstract look. Wait, often uh, computer scientists think of uh, chemicals as some sort of subtype of graph, but they're actually sort of three-dimensional structures. Here's a, here's a sort of space-filling model of ibuprofen. You can see the, the red is oxygen. This is the uh, aromatic ring in the middle. If you remember your chemistry, oops. And actually, of course, they're not static. They actually move around, vibrate. Yeah. These are proteins. So the protein is uh, on the order of it, several, maybe a thousand times bigger than the small molecules. And these molecules are going to bind to it specifically at places. Ah, okay, so this is, this is the diamond synchrotron. So a synchrotron is a big x-ray machine that makes uh, high-powered x-rays which are used to, to get the structures of the, the protein. So you crystallize a protein, then fire these x-rays at it and you, get, and you can work out the structure of the, of the protein. What's interesting, I think, is the size of this. Uh, so if you see this, these little dots down there are cars. So this is the size of a, a large football stadium. So I think computer science, we are often, we're not imaginative and uh, should think of the physicists and the uh, biologists managed to build tools this big. We should think, how much could we do with a billion dollars? You know, it's like... Uh, and the justification for diamond was uh, to treat diseases. You know, so it's QSAR type justification. Though that the physicists want it for their own reasons as well. Well, here's a big protein. This is the protein. This is a small molecule inter interacting with it. That's the sort of typical of the scale of the whole thing. This is a close-up view. And this one is just to show you the sort of the level, the complexity of the interactions. This is like a cartoon of the of that protein I showed you earlier interacting with a small molecule. So there's lots of uh, spatial interactions, very specific. In fact, drugs, if you, if you think you're going to put a drug into a person's body, it's got to target the right place very specifically. You know, you're only going to add a little bit of drug, and it's got to go to that particular correct target and not interfere with anything else. And that's uh, <coughs> can only occur if it's very specifically binding to it. Yeah? Uh, so the probability of it binding there is millions, billions of times more likely than anywhere else. And that's, that's, the, that's what you try to achieve. There's a thing called an assay. Uh, that, an assay is uh, a small biological test which gives you a prediction of how well the actual compound is going to do when you give it to a real human being or whatever. Yeah? So it's a cheaper test than actually giving it to a living human being also more ethical because you can't test millions of drugs on human beings. Okay, so it's a simple test. You normally have two approaches. One is to use a pure protein uh, and measure binding on it. So the protein is then called the target. 
The problem of doing that is that you're never sure that when you put this compound into, into a human being that it's actually going to reach the target because so many other things could happen in a complicated living system. The other approach is to use whole human, whole human cells. And the problem there is that you're never sure what, the, what you're hitting when you put something in. Is it just a target or what? So these are, and both assays are very expensive. So typically a pharmaceutical company will spend you know, hundreds, a couple hundred thousand euros designing an assay for, for one of these trials of compounds. <coughs> okay, so QSARs, this is to machine learning. So a QSAR is a quantitative structure activity relationship. Essentially, it's a function where you, when you input the chemical structure, it outputs a real number of how good that compound is at the, on, the, on the assay. Okay? So it's a function. The input of the function is the structure of a small molecule, and the output is a real number, which is, which is the predicted activity on the assay. Okay, and you typically learn these assays to help you design new compounds. Yeah, so you want... The name of the game is to design a new compound, not just to make an, uh, a good QSAR. That, that's, that's not the, the point of it. The point is that actually making new compounds. Can you see? Okay. Yeah. okay, and the particular QSAR problem depends on what, what is known. So, uh, you know the small molecule structure, and that's the default case. In some cases, you know the structure of the target. In some cases you know exact, so sometimes you know what the target is but you don't know how the small molecule is binding with that target. Sometimes you just, uh, you know how, well, how it's binding like we saw in the previous cartoon. Okay, and these are slightly different problems. In general I'm going to talk about just when we know the small molecule structure. We don't know the actual uh, structure of the protein or that extra information. Okay, and then there's a the problem of how do you represent chemical structure? Uh, so you have to have some way of, I showed you the picture of ibuprofen, in this three dimensional shape. You have to somehow encode that into something which a machine learning statistical program can use. So it's descriptors for a table. Uh, you can represent the bulk properties of the molecule. So log P is uh, essentially how hydrophobic it is, how oily it is. Yeah, so and that's important because uh, it turns out that you don't want to be too oily or not oily enough if you're going to be ill. We are a successful drug. And empirically, we know that's the case. Actually, it's, uh, it's a strange story, actually. So the pharmaceutical industry, their uh, whole business is based around put putting drugs into people. Yeah? So you, th you think that they would know how drugs get into cells. Yeah? So a cell's got a membrane around the outside, and what they always used to believe was that the reason that you want the molecule not to be too oily, but oily enough, is that because it's going to diffuse through the membrane of the cell into the cells. That was always what they told you. Yeah? That turns out to be wrong. And you think that they would have learned that a long time ago because it's sort of core to their business. Uh, it turns out there's actually these proteins which import molecules into the cell and export them. Yeah? And they have to, so any drug has to fit into one of these proteins. And one way the pharmaceutical industry should have realized that what they said was wrong is because if you look at the small molecules in the cell, these the compounds which are actually there, they also have the same amount of oiliness as drugs. So they would have diffused out. You know? <laughs> it was obvious that would have happened. You know? it's, but uh, I don't know, it's strange. I think. They don't really seem to th step back and think about what they're doing. They, they have these rules that says you should make a molecule of this particular oiliness. They don't really think why. Uh, fingerprints. The standard way to do this in the industry now is using these fingerprints, which I think is a particularly ugly thing to do, but this is the standard. So what you do is you have maybe 100 to 1,000 Boolean attributes which say something about the molecule. Each attribute says, for instance, is there a an oxygen in the molecule? Is there a alcohol group? Is there a alkane group? Is there a benzene group? Okay, so they have all these complicated questions. In each one you just get yes or no. And you get this long fingerprint. Typically at least a hundred long, possibly a thousand, which is standard. Yeah? And that's what they use. 
Uh, some work's been done in 3D shape, etc. Okay, so that's the background of QSARs, and we, are, we have this project to work on what's called Met, what we're calling MetaQSAR. So there's the literature on QSARs is vast; thousands of papers have been published. Uh, every possible machine learning method has been applied to the problem, and the result of that is it's not surprising that for some problems some methods work well, and for other problems other methods work well. Yeah. Uh, probably down to some deep bias in, uh, in actual learning problems. So what we're trying to do in this project is to do some meta QSAR learning. We're going to apply lots of QSAR methods, uh, sorry, we're going to apply lots of statistical methods and machine learning methods to QSAR data and look how they well they do on different problems and try to figure out why they do what they do. And Hopefully there'll be some lessons to the pharmaceutical industry and people designing drugs so that we can treat malaria and things better. So that's the, the basic idea of the project. Okay, so we have uh, different databases for, from, from QSAR. We're building this sort of intermediate uh, databases which we're going to use in the learning. And we're at the stage where we're sort of building the infrastructure for all this. So I'm going to show you some our initial results, but these are very, uh, very initial. And that we're just showing that we actually can get everything to work. Okay, as I say, every almost, I'm pretty sure every form of statistical machine learning has been applied to QSARs. Uh, how they differ is to the a priori presumptions they make about the learning task. And they assume that the data is going to be represented in a standard way, which is a tuple of attributes. Okay, so one thing that uh, made this possible, uh, so when I started working on QSARs, uh, also about 20 years ago, that I had to input the data myself by hand. Yeah, I'd read a scientific paper, and I would have to translate that data into the computer by hand, manually. There is this now. There is this database called Kemble. It was essentially what they've done was that this private company uh, manually curated. There was this journal called the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, which is the uh, the top one in the field of medicinal chemistry, which is the area of chemistry where you design drugs, medicinal chemistry. And actually, I'm quite proud. I have a paper in it. You know, it's like a, it's, it's a real chemist-type journal. It's, so uh, what they did was this private company manually, essentially, typed all the data from these papers into a big database. Yes. Yeah? So uh, it's based on around about 60,000 publications, and they manually trans took all this data uh, and put it into into a big database of databases. So each one of the paper, typically in a general medicinal chemistry paper, you have a description of maybe 100 compounds, maybe less, the, what the assay was, and how well the compounds did in the assay. Yeah, that's what a typical paper looks like. And they may well have applied some sort of regression method to that data. So they, this company sort of collected all this data, and they were going to sell it, but they went bankrupt. Uh, somehow the business plan didn't work, I don't, uh, which is good for us, because the, uh, the Wellcome Trust, which is this giant medicinal chemist, sorry, this giant medical charity in Britain, uh, they sort of stepped in and bought the database and then made it online. So the EBI now have this database. So it's publicly available to anyone who wants to look at it. Okay. Uh, has anyone heard of the Wellcome Trust? It's, this. it's their, I don't know, their, this giant medical charity. They're worth, I don't know, they're worth tens of billions of pounds. Uh, never give me a penny, mate. never give me a penny in my life. I've applied, uh, I don't know, at least, I don't know, six or seven times. So every time now I apply, I double how much I ask for. <laughs> so, uh, 
because so it's like the you know, St. Petersburg paradox, but they're infinitely rich as far as I can tell. <laughs> but uh, we shall see whether I die for so they <laughs> give me the money. Uh, yeah, so this nice database, it's manually extracted, it's very clean. Uh, it's got 60,000 publications, 10,000 targets. So target is one particular type of protein they're trying to uh, design drugs against. And 12 million activities, one and a half million dis distinct compounds. So it's a very nice large database. And this allows us for the first time to really do uh, MetaQSAR work and that all the, there's lots of data out there we can actually work on. Okay, so I s okay, this would be a typical uh, representation of a molecule. We've got the molecular weight, log p is hydrophobicity, and here we've got the, the long fingerprints of the Boolean descriptors. And as part of the project, we want to find out which ones of these are really important, which ones not. There's different uh, many different varieties of fingerprints you could choose, and we want to test out which ones work. Uh, that's one of the parts of the project. And we've been putting together all this complicated IT infrastructure, so we have the, the basic databases here, we have the selection of algorithms, the machine learning algorithms. Uh, here, what we're calling bioactivity databases, the the database which contains the level one machine lear learning problems. So these are the QSAR problems. And this one over here is like the meta QSAR database. So that's going to describe where each of the problems is one of the examples. Okay. Uh, and we're open ML, so we're going to export the uh, at least the, the basic QSAR databases to OpenML is a permanent place to keep them. Okay, that's what I said. Back to the data, it stores the QSAR dataset information and the datasets. And the meta QSAR database is the metadata set. And at the moment, these are in MySQL. Though we have ambitions to put it into uh, in a semantic web RDF format. Okay, this is uh, what we've been working on. So we have this R meta QSAR, R package that implements and runs the QSAR models. So it tries to put all this together. So it takes the data from the medicinal chemistry databases, Kemble, etc computes the fingerprints, these are the, the descriptors of the molecules, calculates the molecular properties, these are also descriptors of the molecules, but those only have to be done once each time. And you created these data sets, these sort of roughly 60,000 data sets. And we want to learn QSAR models for all the different data sets using different algorithms, using different uh, different sets of fingerprints, etc., and learn what's important. We also want to describe the targets, the targets of the proteins. We want to see whether there's different classes of target. For instance, there's a class called the uh, uh, GPCRs. These are probably the most important class of targets. These are a particular type of protein which sit in, they sit in membranes and receive signals. Uh, so your eye is based on GPCRs. Your nose is based on them. Lots of internal signaling in the body is based on them. Okay. And I don't know, they're one of the most important targets. A couple of years ago, the person got Nobel Prize for... Actually, two people have got Nobel Prizes for finding the structure of uh, GPCRs. One was for retinal, the one in your eye, and something like 15 years later for the one uh, in the brain. So most of your brain signaling is done by through GPCRs. Yeah. So there might be something special about GPCRs which influence the learning, so we want to, to have a look at that as well. So it take a long time to put all this together into a system that works. Uh, okay, so I'm going to 
uh, briefly describe to show that this actually works. We've, we wanted to show that the whole system could work together, so we decided to do our initial hundred data set problem. So we're going to just apply our, our method. Yeah. You know, one brief question during the talk? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, you said that basically every method has been applied to this kind of method for machine learning, and I assume from your explanation that it's usually a regression, a regression technique, right? Well, and mostly yes. Was, uh, um, how, how important is pre-processing? Assuming that this is right, what I just said, how important is pre-processing for these data sets? Is this something you really need to get right, or do you basically, or do you know how to do this and just push in then the data to the usual regression technique? By what do you mean by pre-processing in this case? I don't know. I mean, I don't know your data, but so the data is taken from these papers. Yes. Yeah, so, th and these are quite clean data because each yeah. point is an expensive biological experiment. Yeah. So uh, we're not processing it after that. Uh, I suppose we could sort of put it all on the same scale or something like that, which may be something to think about. You know. Uh, but apart from that. There is a sort of, they're roughly about the same scale anyway, they're not. Uh, the data may have, be of different reliability depending on how much is known about the assay, but that's quite hard to get out, you know. Uh, I don't think they really put too much information in when they extracted all this information out. So uh, we're assuming that the data is reasonably good and we're not doing anything with it. Sure. Uh, when you showed uh, the, the, the table, which is a representation of what the data basically looks like, uh, it oh. was mostly oh. just the description of the drug itself, right? So the yes, yes, here yeah. binary fingerprints yes. and uh, some properties of, of the chemical is also the, the target always known or not? Uh, in these cases, yes, and that's yeah. uh, that's I believe so. And, okay, so actually coming back to the pre-processing, so uh, what we have done is that we have collaborators who are proper uh, medicinal chemists in the University of Dundee, uh, and we've taken their version of the Kemble data set in that, the ones which they think they have confidence in. So they've gone through it and said that, yeah, we really believe this lot. Yeah? So it's sort of been cleaned up in that sense in that we haven't just applied everything. We've taken data which our collaborators think is, is the best data. Okay. Yeah, so we wanted to just to see whether we can get everything to work. Uh, we've took 100 data sets. Uh, small data sets, and that's important when you look at, uh, because we wanted it to didn't take too long. Uh, we used the standard fingerprints and the standard descriptors. Uh, we used sequential forward search feature selection to all data sets. We used five-fold cross-validation uh, and root mean square error model performance. just to show that everything could work. We took 18 regression methods from the MLR package. Okay. Uh, yes, so basic standard things. Uh, this is a sort of pie chart of which method did best on each of the problems. Uh, I'm not sure if you can put much weight onto this. Uh, this is standard, bulk standard linear regression worked really well. And uh, that's probably something to do with the size of the data sets, I think. It's, if you've got a really small data set, it's hard to s apply something more sophisticated. So these are just, yeah, just showing that we could actually get everything working together. Uh, this is uh, the average root mean square error for the different methods. Which one? I think. So this is linear regression again. What's RVM? 
It's RVM. It's something to do worse here. I don't know. Relevance Sorry? That's the relevance vector machine, right? Probably. You know better. You know? <laughs> it's doing very badly here. <laughs> For whatever reason. I have to admit, I haven't used this very often. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, just, yeah, I don't put any weight on uh, these results. Just showing that we can actually get things to work and that uh, the handle doesn't fall off when you try to turn it. Uh, this is for one particular data set, the different methods applied. Oh, no. This is the average for the different data sets of, of the, all the methods together. So some are harder to predict than others. Yeah? Okay, and for the, uh, the MetaQSAR problem, we need to have some way of describing the data. These, at the moment, we've got just use some really basic ones uh, about, uh, about the data, which are completely generic, like dimensionality, instance count, things like that. Okay. And this is the decision tree you get out of it. So it just shows I don't know if you can see the the first choice is mean standard deviation of numerical attributes, explicit diversity index. But as I say, it's this is our initial results. I just showing that everything works and it can be done. And hopefully, in one year's time, it will, will have been done. Oh, okay, I wanted to say something about relational learning. So this is where it's, it's all started. Uh, so I have a long history of working on relational learning. So trying to represent molecules, not by this sort of fingerprint approach, which I think is remarkably ugly, but using uh, first order methods, using predicate logic. Okay. And We've been working on this for a long time, and one of the reasons I didn't put actually in the grant application, but one of the real reasons for doing this work is I really want to test whether relational methods, how well they work against uh, all the best regression methods on a large proper data set. Because uh, no one's ever really compared things. We have some... Uh, so we have our own evidence ourselves when we're playing around with these things that they work pretty well. But we've never had enough data to show that. So the nice thing about relational methods for, for drug design is that uh, you have a nice representation that's really close to what the chemists use. Okay. Okay, so drug design and relational learning. So we've been working on this for 20 years. We have this really nice representation where you can represent the relational structure of the molecule and sort of map it into the logic. Oops. Uh, and on the basic level, you can just put in the atoms and bonds and the relationships between them and use that as the representation. But you can also add background knowledge about different structural groups. Uh, and there's no need to actually do all this fingerprint stuff. And this is some initial work we did showing that you could actually find certain sub-patterns in, in bigger molecules. So this is this pattern serves to discriminate between mutagenic and non-mutagenic compounds. So what I wanted to do as part of this MetaQSAR is to also compare uh, relational methods to see how well they do, whether this radical different representation works. It's very nice as well because you can add the three-dimensional stuff, you can add chemical group information. Uh, I told you molecules uh, move. They're all constantly vibrating. Uh, this is important because when you, if you do the physical chemistry and try to model it, you won't probably get one minimal structure, you'll have several minimal structures. And you're not sure which one is the one that's actually physically interacting with the protein necessarily. So it's uh, 
one of these representations is important, but you're not sure which one. So that's, that's an interesting machine learning problem as well. What's that called technically again? I forgot. Where you have different, different representations of the same instance. Is it a multiple instance problem? Yes. yes. Multiple, multiple instance, I think, yeah. And we have multiple views, so multiple feature representations, or multiple observations which belong to the... Same no, it's map. multiple representations of the same thing. So this was where the problem started in this drug design model. This is multi-view, I would say, then. So you can kind of expect these kinds of features and look at the data in this way, and this way, and this way, and one of them. No, no, it's the same, same features, but you're not sure which one of these is the correct one. It sounds like multi-instance. Yeah. It is multi-instance, yes. I, my memory has come back. The features it's are the same, just the values are different. Yes. Uh -huh. It's like you have a bunch, uh, like a chain of keys, you know which one fits. Yeah, so this is, the this was the problem which, how it, the first one that came out of machine learning was this multi-confirmations of drugs. Okay, I wanted to say about, about the robot scientists, because we were working on so robot scientists, what we're trying to do is automate scientific research. Uh, you represent the problem. Okay, we want to make a computer robotic system which can, in some sense, autom do its own research. So we have uh, background knowledge about our problem, normally represented in logic. We have some way of forming the hypotheses, some novel hypotheses about that background area, using abduction or induction. In QSAR, we're actually going to use induction. We have some way of forming uh, efficient experiments. We have laboratory automation to do the experiments. And we cycle around until there's a final theory or we run out of some resource. And our so robot scientist Eve is designed to do QSAR learning and early stage drug design. Okay. So the whole thing sort of fits together. We want to do the meta QSAR for, for Eve. Uh, these are the diseases we're looking at. Uh, these are the actual parasites. We want to find drugs which kill. Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax. Uh, this is an interest. This is one we've been working on a lot, actually. So this is this species here is the one that kills most people, especially children in Africa. Falciparum. Uh, most people in the world get vivax. That's more common in Southeast Asia, South America. It used to be very common in Britain, it was called the ague, and I'm sure it used to be very common here, you know, this, all this water you've got. Uh, it used to go all the way up to the Arctic Circle because, the, although there's no mosquitoes in the winter, it, unlike falciparum, it can hide in your body over the winter. So it's, n fresh infections were caused in the summer by someone having the, overwintering the, the parasites. Uh, yes. These are our targets, dihydrofolic reductase. This is my one favorite target of all the, in the world. This, for some reason, this is probably the best target for, in the world. Uh, the first anti-cancer drug was against this, this, this enzyme. Uh, if you have a bladder infection, you get an antibiotic which targets this enzyme. If you get malaria, you're very likely to get a drug which targets this enzyme. It's the most important choke point in living systems. Okay, okay to formalize it for the robot scientists, we use uh, graphs and standard chemoinformatics methods for the background knowledge. We use, uh, Eve is using Gaussian process modeling to do the QSAR. Uh, and we use active learning to decide on efficient experiments. So how the pharmaceutical industry does drug design is that they, they have an assay. I'll have to explain to you what an assay is. It's some cheap test. And then they have a large compound library. Normally this consists of hundreds of thousands of compounds, maybe millions of compounds. And what they do is they test every single compound, one after the other, against the assay. And once you've done that, which typically takes, even if, even if uh, high throughput robotics will still take them weeks to do that, they then look at the, the active compounds, double check them with a more expensive assay to make sure it's not a false positive, because 
most drugs are going to, the, the prior or most of the compounds are going to be inactive. And then they do the QCR learning and make some new compounds to fit the drugs. What Eve does is try to automate these three steps. So Eve starts with a compound library, starts screening them randomly. After it's seen enough hits, it stops random screening, goes back, does a more expensive assay, and then learns a QSAR, and then chooses compounds from its library to test that QSAR using active learning. Okay. And the hope was that would be more efficient and cost effective than this sort of stupid way of brute force testing everything. And the idea is that if you can find most of the hits without going through the whole library, you'll save money and time, because you don't, time's very important. If you actually do find a blockbuster drug, Blockbuster is one where you earn at least a billion dollars a year. So saving a couple of weeks' time on the patent, what is that? That's quite a lot of money. It's the two weeks. Uh, so that's one twenty-fifth of a billion. What's that? That's quite a lot of money. Yeah. So that's, you really want to do it quickly if you're in the pharmaceutical industry because once you've once you've made your patent, time is time rolling. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's possible that it's more efficient to do it this way, and that's what we were testing. Okay, we use Gaussian process models. The nice thing about them is they're generative, which helps with the active learning. We wanted to compare this intelligence strategy of uh, choosing compounds from your, your library, which you think are going to be hits, and to test the QSARs against just doing everything, which is begin at the beginning and go on until you come to the end and stop, you know, which is... Huh? Can you add one more sentence on how you use the Gaussian processes in this active learning? Is this basically deciding where to do another experiment which is unlabeled? Yes, so you want to take a compound from your library which we don't know yet, which is going to... Okay, well how, to, how to do the active learning is still a research question. How, wh so you which use some kind of, kind of optimized entropy for that through the Gaussian process, so you you take the next one where you're most unsure about? This work no, because uh, unlike in classical active learning, you, you don't care how well you predict inactive drugs or ones at the low end. Yeah? So you don't want to minimize your uncertainty down there. You, it's at the top end you're interested in. So you have to Something like expected improvement that you do with the, with the process? Yeah, we've tried <laughs> lots of different things, yes. So uh, we w it's some sort of compromise between exploration and optimizing at the top end. That's, but it's not completely clear of what's best. And so interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Ah, okay, this is what it's saying here. So you need to balance this exploration and this optimization here. Uh, the approach we used is where we combined estimate activity and high variance. So we tried to balance the two things together. So this was work with uh, the University of Leuven. Uh, another complication is that uh, you want to do it in batch, which makes it computation much, much harder because it's easy to optimize one, but then if you want to choose the best 64 or something, it's really hard. Okay, I was trying to explain these diagrams. So this uh, over here is the compounds. Uh, and this is the active learning so that uh, here we're finding compounds faster than randomly by using the sort of active learning and we do it to completion. And this is the cost here. So. Stopping about here is the most cost-effective thing to do. Therefore, after here, you're starting to lose money relative. To and this is some sort of this exploration of most of the, the space. So we had this model of how everything, how much everything costs, and by playing around with the different costs, you can make different things. Uh, so you want to put how much does it cost you to miss one of the active compounds? Uh, how valuable would that be? How much does each compound cost? So we explored the sort of the parameter space, and most of the space it is rational to do more intelligent than just try everything. Especially if you can do the assays quickly and you have a very large library. Okay, so we have uh, using Eve's database for MetaQSAR as well. The advantage here is that we've used the same target from different species, which is a 
an unusual thing to do for the pharmaceutical industry. So it uh, allows us to, to compare different things. Okay, this is Eve's hardware. Uh, the most interesting thing, I think, is this acoustic liquid handler. Uh, so it turns out now that if you want to move small amounts of liquid around, the best way to do that is not to use pipette tips anymore, but to use uh, some sort of sonic system, which uh, the sort of makes the liquid vibrate and little droplets, exactly two and a half nanoliters, fly up and land on the plate where you want it to, to stick to. Yeah. And if you want 10 nanoliters, you say four drops, please, and the four drops are pinged up. And this is much more accurate and much cheaper than using pipette tips. Okay, so I'll try to show a movie here. Okay, this is what, so Eve is about uh, from here to that pillar and about this wide. And it's got these two robot arms, uh, these Mitsubishi ones, which they're a bit smaller version of the ones that build cars. They're very, very precise, this was accurate in their movements. Now this is the liquid handler. Uh, which does the pinging of the droplets. And this is what's called a 384 plate. So there's 384 little, small little vessels. Each one will be one of the experiments, one of the tests, and put different drug into different ones. Okay, this is, comes from the compound library. Each, each one of these different wells has a different drug in it, which some chemist has made at some point. We only have about 15,000 compounds, which for well, the pharmaceutical industry, they have, I say, millions. So so-called crown jewels. Uh, okay, so I haven't discussed the assay because one of the most successful design parts is the actual assay. We use this clever idea from biology to, to make assays which uh, allow you to target particular enzymes but also do it in a living system which is more robust in, the, in human cells. So we use yeast as an assay system. Stop it there, I think. <coughs> we deliberately have the robots going slowly because, uh, especially when they're, if you move them really fast, it's scary <laughs> and they may hit something, and also it's more likely to, to drop something. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, this is the we have found. Uh, 
lots of new compounds. We've also been working on repositioning drugs. So the idea of repositioning drugs is that you, you take a compound which has been shown to be not too dangerous because they're using it for some other, for some disease X, and you show that it works against disease Y. Now this is work we did on uh, Trichopanosome brucei, which is, this is the organism which causes sleeping sickness in Africa. Okay, this is the uh, most exciting thing, is that we found this compound which is active against malaria, uh, dihydrofolic reductase inhibitor, and it's, I'm really sure it's safe because it's and a well-known brand of toothpaste, you, uh, you get it, and I've seen it in mouthwashes, and, uh, and toothpaste is not that dangerous to eat, you know, it's, children do it all the time, you know, it's, uh, Yes, yeah, so it's it's quite I'm quite excited with this, and we're just uh, trying to do so that it works best against this comp this malaria called the Vivax one I mentioned. The problem with Vivax is that we still don't know how to cultivate it in the lab. Uh, I said this once at this meeting, and then it's, I said I did it as my PhD. You know. <laughs> But they, what they meant was, if they had a fresh supply of blood locally, you could keep them going for maybe a few days. You know, we still can't cultivate them really well. So if you want Viavax, you need to go somewhere where there's malaria. So we have this collaboration in uh, Manaus in the Amazon, where people have... And that's what's quite shocking. It's often come in, you can see from the genetics, they've been infected multiple times. You know, there's, not, there's multiple strains of Viavax in them. Yeah. Okay, I should say something about constructive learning. So the, the point is that we want to really actually make a new compound, not just test compounds from the library. So it's not active learning, we want to, what compound will optimize this particular assay? Uh, and that's still an open research question, you know. The number of compounds that have been synthesized ever is a few million. The sort of space of compounds you could synthesize is literally astronomic, you know, it's uh, there's different estimates, but there's like a number of games of chess. It's a ridiculously large number. Yes. Yeah, so okay, here's 10 to the 60 is, is a reasonable estimate of how many compounds you could synthesize. Yeah, and we've only ever made a couple of million compounds in the whole of human chemistry. And what's really nice now is that you get these chemical synthesis robots, so you can actually get a machine. They can do a lot of chemistry. They can't do everything yet, but most of chemistry they can probably do. Yeah. But it's a complicated question in uh, machine learning and optimization. How do you decide which compounds to make? Because you have to take into account the synthesis uh, aspects of it. Also, how do you optimize this particular QSAR? Finish off. Oh, I'm going to talk about yeah, robot scientists and automation of science. So I, in chess, there's this knowledge between chess and science. In chess, that uh, there is this continuum from beginners to grandmasters, and I think the same is true for science. Between, between the type of science that Eve can do now, to what I can do to your Einsteins and your Newtons and things, and if you believe that there is this continuum, it's not just no step function there, then robots I think will get better and better at science. And uh, certainly the hardware is getting better, computer and machine learning is getting better, AI is getting better, the robotics is getting better. There's very little now that robots can't do in the lab. And I think that the collaboration of human robot scientists together is uh, is better than either one on its own. Just like even now in chess, even if my laptop can beat the world champion, human and computers together play better chess than computers do alone. And humans and computers playing science can do better than either alone. Ah oh yes, so this uh, Nobel laureate Frank Vulcevic is on record saying in 100 years time that the best physicist will be a machine. Which I, which I like, because uh, obviously it means the best scientists, of course. You know, 
computer scientists and biologists don't, don't really count if you're a physicist. Uh, I don't know, I, we shall see. It's, it's an empirical thing. Oh, okay, no conclusions. Okay, uh, <coughs> I'd like to thank my collaborators in Manchester and Brunel and Dundee who are on this Metacusar project. Uh, the collaborators in Cambridge who've worked on making the assays for the drug design work. Collaborators in Leuven helped in the machine learning and in Aberystwyth for the robotics. And I'd like to thank you for inviting me here and listening to my talk. Thank you.